Now we're going to read another portion of scripture that's in John, and today's sermon is, is entitled, The Risen Christ, His Peace, His Power, and His Purpose. And so we're going to look at another section of scripture. The first it was read this morning in Mary Magdalene, and uh, when, he fir- when, they fir- when she first saw Jesus. And then this is the second time that Jesus appeared to his disciples in John 20, verses 19 through 23. It says this, On the eve of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, the doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. And Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. This is the reading of the Lord this morning in the scriptures. The Bible has two parts, the Old Testament and New Testament. The New Testament has 27 books, four gospels to tell us a different versions of Jesus' life from different perspectives. 21 letters to explain the meaning of Jesus for our lives. And one history of the early church, which is in the book of Acts. And then one on the prophecy on what's to come at the end of the age. All 27 of these books deal with Jesus as alive. From the risen, uh, the, the central theme of Jesus is that he is alive and living reality to us today. He himself being very God and very man came to us as God's gift to us. So this evening of this Sunday that he arose from the dead, and when he, after he appeared to Mary Magdalene, he now appears to all the disciples. And notice three things. The doors are locked, the disciples are frightened, and Jesus comes to them and stands among, among their midst. These three factors tell us three things that we can know about the risen Christ, and I want you to, to understand today as Christ deals with you and us today. First, we come up to that the doors are locked. Jesus didn't have to knock on the door. He did not even have to open the door. He simply was there. And he wasn't a ghost. If you look at verse 20, he showed them his hands and his side. In Luke 24, 39, the gospel there says, Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. He had his eternal body that, in a sense, when we go to heaven and God gives us a new body and gives us, uh, a, a, we become, again, given that, that eternal body, it's going to be different. It's different than the angels. So he has this physical body, but not exactly like ours. It's the same, but yet different. But he was simply there in spite of the closed doors. I want you to understand today that Jesus can go anywhere. He can go where no one else can go. He can go where no counselor can go. He can go where no doctor can go. He can go where no lover can go. He can reach you and reach into you anywhere at any time. There's no place where you are. There's no depths that Jesus can't penetrate. Jesus' resurrection from the dead fits him to do what no one else can do. There is no one else like Jesus in all the universe. He is alive. And he is a one and only God-man. And what he is capable of, what he is truly capable of in your life and my life, we cannot even imagine. He is healing wonder. In all the complex layers of your life and my life, he comes into that. And he makes us anew in him. We become born again. He comes in where we can't even understand ourselves. And to him, it's all familiar ground in him working in our lives. The second part that happens is that they were afraid in the scripture. You see, the Roman government was was tense. And they were on the lookout, and they must be alert for any possible uprising again because this Jesus was going to be the king of the Jews, and and he was coming in to take over the rulership. So the Roman soldiers and everyone else was on high alert. 
And so those who followed Jesus were scared. They were afraid. Also the religious leader that won back now their popularity that Jesus was taken away. Their place in society now was set back in stone and they wanted to stomp out anything of these Jesus followers. Verse 19 says that the doors have been locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Their leader was just crucified. Fear is totally understandable. And into that fear, Jesus walks. Fear. It's one thing that many of us face time and time again. Fear that we won't be prepared to, to do what is expected of us. Fear that at times that our children will make a, sheep, a shipwreck out of their lives. Fear that we won't have faith to die well. Fear that we might drift into worldliness or uselessness. Fear that we may just not be a success and will be a failure in life. So many fears are out there that can stop us. What Jesus is saying in this action is, I come to my own when they are afraid. I don't wait for them to call on me or to get together. I don't have to have them have enough faith to overcome fear. I come to them and I have enough faith to overcome their fears. The risen, living Jesus is still doing this today. He comes when we cry out to him in fear, and he helps us. I've called out to him several times, several times in my life. Please, Lord, I need your help. I'm fearful of this before me. But he comes with the promise that we find in Isaiah 41.10, and it says this, fear not. I am with you, and be not dis dismayed. I am your God, and I will help you. Isn't it awesome to know that we have a God that is there for us in time of need? He's there in, for us in times of our fear. He is there waiting for us just to be able to receive him. He'll do this for you if you receive him into your life for who he really is. The third aspect of this verse is found in verse, the end of verse 19. It says the doors are locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them. The point here is that he came right in the middle of their meeting. Jesus comes to them and stands in their midst. He didn't come to the edge. He didn't call out. He went and he went right to them. He wasn't playing games with them. He wasn't toying with their faith. He wanted them to see him and to know him and to believe him and to love him. And that's what he wants for you today. That's what I want for you today. I want you to experience the living Jesus. I want you to know him in a personal way. I want you to be able to draw near to, his, to who he is and to his life. I want you to be able to experience that he can go to that place that no one else can go. I pray that in our service that you'll feel the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart. Many times in this service, as we were here and we experienced music and different things and the, even the, the flags, there was such a presence of God that was here, wasn't there? Just the presence of God. To be able to have that come into your life when you're struggling and when you're trying to live this thing called life. But the whole part of that needs to take place is you receiving that. If you just sense God, even here in your heart right now, just reach out to him and thank him for the cross. Thank him for the forgiveness of your sins. And just reach out and say, Lord, I just, I just want to receive what you did on that cross for me 2,000 years ago. I received the forgiveness, and now I want to give my life to you. Right now where you're sitting, you can say that right now to Jesus because he hears you. And he hears your heart. He speaks to your heart. I can only speak to your mind, but Jesus speaks to your heart right now. In this passage of Scripture, there are three gifts in what Jesus says. So what does he say? We see in the first appearance to the disciples, there's four, or depending on how you count them, three things, three gifts for you. There's a gift of peace a gift of power, 
and a gift of purpose. You see, the opposite of these things, the opposite of, of peace is conflict. The opposite of power is weakness. And the opposite of purpose is aimlessness. And so many times it's a shame that we find ourselves really in the world today that we're in conflict. There is weakness and there's aimlessness. Even as Christians, sometimes we live our lives and we, we miss the understanding that after salvation, and salvation is a great thing, that, that there's purpose and there, there's, a, there's a reason for us to be living for our Lord. Many lives are ruined by conflict and weakness and aimlessness. Jesus didn't come in the world to die and to rise again to ruin our lives. He came to save our lives. And when we're able to see that he saves us from ruining our lives, he becomes our peace and our power and our purpose. And I'm praying that this morning, that for you, that you'd be able to understand the words that God wants to say to you and that the, the Holy Spirit would be speaking to your heart, to your soul, to make Jesus your peace and make Jesus your power and to make Jesus your purpose. Two times he says, peace be with you. Verse 19 and 21, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together and the doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again he said, but peace. Be. Why did he mention that twice? Why did he mention it twice? I believe because before there's power and purpose, he wants us to establish a peace in our lives. This is so very important in our lives, the, the first for us experience peace. Do you have peace in your life? Are you walking in a way with the Lord that you can experience peace every day of your life because he is our peace? He initiates peace with us. The Apostle Paul, who wrote 13 of the New Testament books, says this in, in Ephesians 2, 14 through 18, Ephesians 2. And he explains it like this. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups, and the two groups are Jews and Gentiles, and destroyed the barrier between them, the dividing wall of hostility. He came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Peace is accomplished. Jesus offers his disciples is a peace that passes all understanding. It says Jesus is saying, I'm the one who, who died. I'm the one who you abandoned, and I'm the one who was pierced for your transgressions, as it says in Isaiah 53, 5. And the reason I can offer you peace is because my blood my blood has covered all your sins. If you trust in me, they won't be held against you. And the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the curse that has been put upon you will be removed away completely. The wrath of God is God turning away from us. Christ reconciled us both to God through the cross. And therefore, he killed all hostility. All the hostility between God and us was absorbed on that cross. He says, here, look at my, my hands. Look at my side. I made peace with these. Justice was satisfied. Peace between you and God and me was established with the price that I paid. You had a debt that you owed, but only I could pay it. So peace with Jesus, peace with God the Father, even peace with others and peace with yourself comes when we're able to receive Jesus who reconciled us because of the cross. Well, how to receive this? Does everyone have it? No, it's a gift. It's a gift. Peace is a gift. And we receive it 
We receive it as a gift. And better yet said, when we receive him, we receive peace. And when we walk away from him, our peace walks away with him. If you have the risen living Christ as your Savior and Lord, it's a treasure. He becomes our friend. He becomes a peace that enables to give us life. In John 1, 12, it says about this, about peace. It says, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Have you received that? Can you call yourself a child of God? If you've received him and you believe in his name, then you have the right to become a children of God. Romans 5.1 says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus offers you that, and this morning I offer you that. And it's free. I hope you can receive it this morning. If you've never taken it, take it today. Receive it as a gift. This is foundational. If we don't have peace with God, then we can take all the other gifts and we can't make sense out of them. It never works right because peace is first and it's free. Peace becomes the root for the power and the purpose that Jesus gives to us. And both of these are mentioned in verse 21 and 22. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. That's the purpose. That's the purpose of our lives. You want to know what God's will is for your life? I am sending you. Well, where am I sending you? If you're in college, God is sending you there. If you're in your workplace, God has sent you there. It, wherever God is, where you're living right now, God has sent you there for this time and for this purpose. I am sending you, says the Father. And then when he said this, he breathed on them, and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit becomes our power. It becomes the enabling for us to be able to fulfill our purpose. Jesus poured out his Holy Spirit and was going to be pouring it out in the book of Acts. And this happens about seven weeks after his resurrection, and you read about it in the books of Acts. But in Acts 1.8, he says at that time when the Holy Spirit, he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, there's a whole, whole study about the Holy Spirit in us and the Holy Spirit upon us. But we receive power and authority when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. And Jesus, at that time, performs this act before the Holy Spirit was released for all. He, he took this group of, of men, and he, and he breathes on them, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Realize that my breath, my life, and my, my word will all be empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's released into your life. Jesus said in 14, I will not leave you as orphans. I come to you. The risen living Jesus comes to us and he has sent the Holy Spirit. He has breathed it upon us to live upon us. He didn't leave the church as orphaned, but he inspired it in the book of Acts as I'm sending the Holy Spirit to us. And he says, as I'm sending you, I'm sending my Holy Spirit upon you to empower you. I want you to live in the world as my representatives. I want you to live in the world as my ambassadors. I want you to take my peace and take my power and glorify my Father the way I have glorified my Father. I want your life to be a reflection of my life, and, and I'm not just asking you to do that, but I'm empowering you to do that by the Holy Spirit. This is our central purpose of our existence. Jesus comes to us and, and gives us peace with God. And then, and then he powers us to do all kinds of things. Some things that not even mere human beings can do, but it's empowering of the Holy Spirit. It's a, it's a supernatural thing he does through us. Like defeating our own selfishness. That's a miracle in itself, isn't it? Loving other people who are unlovely, who are unlikable. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. So many things 
we're able to do that we couldn't do before. We may, we may see it as now simple or easy to do now because it's empowering of the Holy Spirit. But when we become Jesus and, and we become Jesus to others, there's something that happens, and it's the Holy Spirit empowering in our lives. As a father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. I'm sending you to extend my peace and my light and my truth, and my life in the world. I'm going to my Father, but I give you my spirit. I'm the power in you, so go and glorify me in this world. That's our great purpose. That's our great challenge. And in the peace of God, by the power of God, to do the will of God, for the glory of God, and for the good of others. Isn't that awesome? that we're, not, we're saved for a reason and a purpose. That's our great, I, I'll repeat it, in the peace of God, we work by in the power of God, and we're doing the will of God. And then God receives all the glory and honor as we do these works. Then in verse 23, we, a little bit puzzling as he says it, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, then they're withhold. Now that, that's kind of awkward and strange. I believe what he's saying here, what he means, that when you tell people about what I've done, you're speaking my words. You're all about my work. You're in the power of my spirit. I'm the one that is speaking through you. And if anyone believes your words, then their sins are forgiven. I have forgiven them because they're hearing my words. And if they don't believe your words, then I don't forgive them. Since you are my voice, you are my truth, I speak of forgiving them through your mouth. The power of our words are so important. I believe in as parents, how we speak in our children, what, what we speak into them is so important that we speak life into them. We speak future in them. We put wood, word pictures, pictures in them about their future and who they can become in God. Because what we speak out of our mouth holds so much power. And, and when you realize that, that we are speaking and, and we're representing the, the King of kings and Lord of lords, that we come with an authority and what we speak can speak life and can speak truth into someone's life. Even this morning, me just being a human being, a human messenger, this morning some of you may be hearing these words and you've never asked Jesus to come into your life. I challenge you right now that you would ask him, hear the words that I'm speaking. And if they're pounding in on your heart, then you know that Jesus is speaking to you. The Holy Spirit's knocking on the door of your heart and he's asking you to receive. Take me in this morning. Take me in this morning. God says to you this morning that I want to forgive your sins. I want you to become my child. I desperately love you with all my heart, and that's why I sent my son. That's God speaking to your heart right now. Let's stand together in closing. Would you bow your heads? Hi, I'm Pastor John McConnell, and I'd like to welcome you today for watching our program. It's just amazing the technology we have today that we're able to live stream all around the world. And we'd like to give you an opportunity, if you'd like to give towards this ministry, you can go online and be able to uh, follow the directions that are on there and be able to give to the ministry that you've been watching. So God bless you. We thank you for being part of Southside Alliance Church today.